Hello, welcome back to the channel. And right before I start, I would like to give a shout out to X God Allocate. X God Allocate is an amazing YouTuber. He uploads great content to YouTube on various games, action games like God of War, Demon Slayer, Call of Duty, Vanguard, Fortnite, and horror games too, like Man of Medan and Dark Deception, just to name a few. I'll be putting a link in the description below so you could check out his channel. I highly recommend it. Subscribe so you could join the legacy. For those not accustomed to it, life in rural Eastern Europe can feel very lonely and isolating. I spent all of my teenage life and most of my childhood in London, but recently, about a year ago, we were forced to move back to the old country due to financial reasons. I couldn't have been older than 3 or 4 when we first made the transition to the United Kingdom, so my memories of my hometown were foggy at best. An old apartment complex in the middle of an industrial district isn't exactly the most scenic place to grow up in either. But though definitely drab at times, it always felt alive. There was always something to do, and the more interesting parts of the town were just a short bus ride away. Here there are only grasslands stretching for miles in whichever direction I look, not to mention the 4 hour drive between me and the nearest city. For the record, I don't have a license. Most of the days out here are spent helping my dad and trying to find a decent internet connection, which is the closest to impossible. You have no idea how many attempts it took me to post this. I've never been much of an extrovert, but having nobody to talk to or relate to takes a toll on you. The local population is primarily comprised of people past their 60s. The last family, with a kid closer to my age, had apparently moved about a decade ago, which, yeah, you could definitely see why. Unfortunately, as you probably already guessed, boredom hasn't been the worst thing that I've had to contend with, not even close. I remember when I first saw her. It was still technically summer at the time, so evenings were tolerable if not exactly warm. Dad and I were taking a walk along the dirt road that connects the village to the nearest highway. He was talking about how I needed to hold out for a few more years and that we'd be able to move again once we saved enough money. The prospects of spending literally years trapped in some desolated hamlet in the middle of nowhere isn't exactly assuring. But with him getting older and mom's disabilities, I can't just abandon them either. I remember looking over at my father, only to notice something in the distance past his shoulder. I strained my eyes. The gloom was far too dense to fully penetrate, but I could definitely distinguish the outline of someone standing amidst the tall grass, towering above it. The figure was that of a tall woman very tall and lanky woman. Her proportions weren't impossible, but they were intimidating, especially complete with the slanted stance and the fact that she just stood there, swaying like a willow in a, w in a windstorm. Dad glanced over his shoulder as well, but then just looked back at me and confused. What is it? He asked. I was so taken aback by the question that I didn't know how to respond. How did he miss the giant woman standing in the middle of the field, directly behind him? I watched as the imposing silhouette suddenly began to descend, almost as if being swallowed by the earth itself, before disappearing beneath the grass entirely. Once I finally managed to articulate what I'd seen, Dad cut our walk short and we, we jogged home. There is nobody that lives here that even comes close to matching that description, but it certainly wasn't beyond the realm of possibility that some creepy tall woman was wandering the steppes at night. Widows aren't exclusive to big cities, you know. I felt nervous whenever I had to go out for the next few days, but the odd encounter eventually slipped my mind. Neither of us ever told mom since we didn't want her to blow the whole thing out of proportion. Besides, she rarely left the house anyways. 
I had all but forgotten about the woman in the steps. That is, until about a week or so later, we were called over by an old couple that lives at the edge of town, conveniently right by the same road. The request wasn't anything out of the ordinary. One of the goats had croaked during the night. Since both of them were in their 80s, they needed our help to drag it out of the pen. We did as they asked, and we were rewarded for our efforts with coffee and toast. It was then that the wife said something to me that I'll never forget. I'll do my best to translate it. The old coot doesn't believe me, but I swear on our grandchildren's lives that I saw something walk down the old path before I went to bed last night. At first, I thought it could have been you, but the girl was much, much taller. Tallest woman I've ever seen. The way she walked was odd too, like she was hunting, limping her way down to town. Dad and I looked at each other from across the table. He chimed in on my behalf. Who do you think it could have been? In hindsight, I am thankful that he stopped me from confessing that I'd seen the woman too. We would have likely been accused of leading her back to the settlement. As I was soon about to find out, folks around these parts love having someone else to blame for their misfortunes. I don't know. She is not from around here, that's for sure. If you ask me, she is probably the reason our animals keep dying. Outsiders have always been a bad omen. Oh, be quiet, you hag. The man and his daughter aren't here to listen to your crazy stories. The husband finally had a chance to intervene, which, after some back and forth, devolved into a typical domestic dispute. We thanked the elderly couple for their hospitality and promptly excused ourselves, though I doubt that either of them noticed. Over the next several weeks, more and more animals kept turning up dead. The closest thing we had to a vet couldn't determine a cause. Goats, sheep, pigs, cattle, and even dogs. Animals that looked completely healthy, one day were gone the next. One day, my parents and I woke up to a coop filled with dead chickens. There was talk about a plague, but the idea was quickly brushed aside. What sort of plague kills overnight with no proceeding symptoms? It was almost as if they were being poisoned, which became the lead theory. That was until the start of October, when a shepherd found something in a small bridge grove that borders the town. Concealed between the trees was the crude arrangement of rocks. They were obviously placed there on purpose, and overlooking them was the cross between a scarecrow and a human-sized effigy made of twigs. It had a rusted cowbell dangling from its neck and a ram skull for a head. There was something about the way he just stood there, arms raised, praising something none of us could see. It made me feel vulnerable, tiny, like there was some benevolent force perpetually looming above us. Witchcraft, someone yelled. We have been cursed, spouted another. We scattered the rocks and burned the idol the same day. As I watched it get swallowed by the flames, I couldn't help but feel that this is what the one who placed it there intended. I still think that this is the exact moment we unknowingly doomed ourselves, and that everything that follows could have been prevented. Too late now though. Things only got worse as the time went on. Animals kept dropping dead for no discernible reason. The bodies were piling up. We couldn't even use the meat, and we feared that it might somehow be tainted. So we ended up just burying them outside the town. It was when the crops, our main source of income and food, started withering and things truly got desperate. Everyone became convinced that there was a witch among us. With my family being the most recent addition to the community, we were obviously the first to fall under scrutiny. Thankfully, my dad managed to appease the growing mob by pointing out that this supposed curse had severely impacted our livelihoods as well. It made no sense that we would be the ones responsible, and so the accusations started getting levied against the next most probable candidate. I won't be using her real name out of respect for the poor woman, so I'll just refer to her as Maria. 
Maria was about the same age as my mother, maybe slightly older, only she never married nor had any kids of her own. I never really got a clear answer as to why and I'm not about to start speculating. All you need to know is that she'd been living in relative solitude for years, which made her a prime suspect in the eyes of the traditionalist populace. Adding to it was the fact that her livestock had overall been spared, though she wasn't even the sole outlier in, the, in that regard. There is no doubt in my mind that her targeting was largely the result of pre-existing prejudice and things were about to get a whole lot worse for her. Every day I would walk by her house and see a fresh batch of crosses carved into her door. People called her all kinds of names whenever they saw her in public. One time I witnessed several women throw rocks at her, which the men eagerly encouraged. You might be wondering why the saner among us didn't do anything to help. The unfortunate truth is that times were already tough and nobody wanted to risk getting themselves or their loved ones implicated by proxy. Also, good luck getting any outside authority to intervene. Nothing short of a murder would convince an officer to come out here. And that's just what happened. That's exactly what it took. Time had been somewhat of a blur since the day I found her. I remember that it had snowed the previous night. Everything was covered in this crisp sheet of white. I was probably on my way to the only general store there is here. It was far too cold for a casual stroll. Suddenly, I heard the distinct intermediate jingle of what sounded like a cowbell coming from somewhere nearby. As I circled past Maria's homestead like I'd always done, I saw her displayed on the foot of her own doorstep like some perverted art exhibit. Her partially stripped body was tied to a fence post, swollen and bruised beyond recognition. Frost clung to her dark hair as it flapped in the freezing wind, obscuring the disfigured features that hardly resembled the face anymore. And there it was. The same bell that we found around the idol's neck now hung from hers attached to a hoop of rope and barbed wire, knocking about by the wind. I was so truly desensitized by that point that I just turned around and went home. Didn't even tell my parents. Somebody did eventually call the police, but nothing really came out of it. There was an investigation, suspects were questioned, but it ultimately got swept under the rug. Maria didn't have any relatives or friends that were willing to pursue the matter further, so it was just sort of forgotten by the time Christmas rolled around. People have their suspicions about who could have done it, of course. It is generally assumed to have been the shepherd, with the help of a few of his drunk buddies, since he had always been Maria's most outspoken detractor, even before any of this curse stuff happened. The thing is though, I don't think he did it. There's a detail that I've been deliberately neglecting to mention. I wanted to get the verifiable facts out of the way first. Throughout most of the events that I've described, the aforementioned tall woman has been haunting me nearly every waking moment of my life. Her presence was subtle at first, barely noticeable and easy to disregard. Maybe I could catch something swaying ominously in the distance that I couldn't fully make out. Perhaps there would be a long shadow stretching across the hallway at night, yet no one dared to cast it. After the desecration of the ritual site, however, any semblance of subtlety was completely done away with. I saw her near everywhere I looked, occupying some dim corner, a lanky figure with bluish gray complexion Drape it in a traditional white dress that was several sizes too small, as though it belonged to a child. Her hair was oily and sparse, barely clinging to her scalp and leaving little of her face to the imagination. God, that fucking face. Apart from its unhealthy hue, there was technically nothing wrong with it. But the way that she would just stand there and look at me with this vacant smile and wide, glassy eyes was just, I honestly can't think of any adjective that would accurately describe how repulsive it felt. 
Dad still didn't see her. I think Mom did, but she just plain refused to acknowledge it, even if the disheveled woman which was standing literally right there, looming over her. One time, I cornered her about it, probably realizing I was teetering on the brink of a mental collapse, and she told me, Your grandmother used to say that there are things out here that like to watch, but hate to be seen. Once you do, it's best to pretend like you didn't. So that's what I did. I spent over two months pretending like the grinning entity watching us from across the room wasn't there. Like it emaciated frame wasn't the first thing that I would see whenever I stepped through the door. I wouldn't go as far as to say I got used to it, trying to go to sleep with that thing silhouette propping against the opposite wall never got easy. And keeping in mind that I, I was dealing with this in parallel with everything going on in town. The reason why I'm telling you this, even though I probably shouldn't, is that the tall woman suddenly stopped appearing around the house just a few days prior to me stumbling across Maria's body. Last week, another murder was reported. The goat herder's wife was found in much the same state, with her battered remains tied to a tree directly outside her house and a cowbell dangling from her neck. I have a feeling that she won't be the last one. So, to summarize, shall we? I'm a teenage girl trapped in the middle of bumfuck nowhere with a homicidal ghost bitch that exclusively play preys on women and may or may not be connected to the curse that's progressively disseminating our livelihoods. I have no access to the outside world and the police can't be asked for help. Fuck my life.